Hey guys, and welcome back to a new Android video. We have a new navigation library, Navigation 3, which at this point is probably nothing new to you, at least if you stick to those typical Android news. I've already made a playlist about Navigation 3, but maybe a question in your mind is, is that library actually something you should already stick to, maybe in your own production project? Should you migrate to it already? Or is it maybe better to still stick to the older Navigation 2 library? Let's take a look. So I've opened two Android Studio projects here. On the one hand, the project from my uh, Navigation 3 library. And here just a sample project from my Compose Multi-Platform Premium course in which I've used Navigation 2, just to compare these a little bit. But let's start with Navigation 3. What does it actually promise? Why did Google decide to make another Navigation library? Well, the core idea around Navigation 3 is that we fully own the backstack. So the backstack in the end, the stack of screens that a user has visited already. And in Navigation 3, we really get such a backstack instance really as Nothing else than a mutable list, after all, in your Jetpack Compose code via this remember nav backstack function. So here, the backstack is nothing else than a nav backstack. Sounds complex, but under the hood, if we take a look there, you can see this is really nothing else than a mutable list. And in the end, a mutable list that Jetpack Compose code can observe. So whenever there is a change of your backstack, that it can also properly show the latest screen that is on top of it. And when we speak of full control over the backstack, then that really means that this backstack data structure, this backstack immutable list is ours. We can do whatever we want with it. We have a, in the end a list of screens with all their arguments that a user has visited and whatever we want to do with this list of screens, we can do. So we could technically reverse it and then therefore reverse the order of the screens the user has visited. We could shuffle it. We could, of course, add new elements. We could remove certain screens of our backstack that are somewhere in between. So we have all the freedom that we also have with a normal mutable list but with our backstack. And that was something that was simply not possible before with Navigation 2. If we take a look at Navigation 2 here, then it works in a much more imperative style. So that means kind of a command based. Because here in Navigation 2, we have these so-called nav controllers, which are just the central uh, controlling units, controlling instances in our code that we can then use to in the end navigate somewhere. So we can say nav controller, go navigate somewhere. Nav controller, pop the backstack. So they are ready made functions where internally they will somehow mutate our backstack. They will, for example, push a new element, a new route here after all on top of this backstack that will somehow pop certain elements from the backstack. So remove a certain number of um, elements and screens from the top of our backstack. But it's not like we really own this backstack. It's instead just mutated under the hood by this navigation framework. While then just exposing such a common API that you just may commonly need, like navigating somewhere obviously popping some screens. But for example, there is no real API in Navigation 2 where we say, okay, if we want to pop a screen from the backstack, but not the topmost screen, but actually a screen that is somewhere in between. So maybe the third last screen the user has been on, if we want to just remove that from the screen history, that's not possible so easily. So let's talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of each of these libraries. First of all, what is Navigation 2? So the approach that I've stick to here in this course actually really good at. Well, on the one hand, it's just, of course, more mature. It's been there around for much longer time, has therefore received more fixes, more maintenance. It is, I would say, very intuitive to use. So even if you don't know what the backstack is and how the backstack data structure works like, functions like navigate or pop up to make it very intuitive to use and pretty easily help you understand what happens if you call these functions. And also certain more complex navigation features, like a deep linking, for example, are pretty easy to implement with Navigation 2. So here, for example, if we take a look in this chat graph that we've built a chatting app here, there is a deep link where we can click on a chat notification and then in the end get to that specific message screen. And you can see this is how we define such a deep link for a specific screen. We define this uh, URI pattern here where we define our very own URI style, pass in certain arguments to know which chat we actually want to visit when tapping a specific notification and that is in the end how deep links work. We additionally need to specify that in the Android manifest, but then we're pretty much done. So those were the upsides of Navigation 2. But what is Navigation 2 bad at? Well, of course, as I've already mentioned, we don't own our backstack. So we have way less control over how we muted our backstack than with Navigation 3. And this just leads to some solutions, especially if you have more uh, complex navigation setups, this leads to some solutions being quite hacky. So usually you can somehow achieve everything you want to achieve, but it's just often workarounds and very hacky. To just give you some examples, let's say you have a login in a register screen and you can get to the register screen from the login screen. 
but you can also get to the logon screen from the register screen by, by a button or so. Now, this is a typical scenario where you want to avoid that a user could infinitely push new register and logon screens on the back stack by just keep on navigating, but you would actually want to reuse an existing instance that is already in the back stack and simply bring that up. That is still something that would be possible here with navigation too, but it already requires you to dive a little bit deeper into its API and how you can actually save the state of certain screens and then bring these back up. You need to look into activity launch modes or another scenario. Let's say you have some kind of onboarding flow with uh, three different onboarding screens where the second one is optional depending on the answer the user has um, made in the first screen. Now let's say the user is now in the third screen and has also previously visited that second screen, which is optional. But one more example, if you actually have a deep link and when the user visits that deep link, so here, for example, when actually getting to a specific chat by clicking on a notification, then sometimes you actually want to not only navigate to that specific chat screen where all the message history can be looked at, but also define which previous screens this deep link should actually lead to so that if the user actually goes back on that screen after having tapped the notification, they actually get back to the chat list screen where they see all their chats. That would be pretty uh, intuitive behavior, at least, if you go back from a chat screen. And doing that is also very hacky with Navigation 2. While with Navigation 3, what you can simply do is you, in the end, own the list. So you can also push more such elements on top of this list. You can also say the very initial state of your app is consisting of five different screens that you predefine, and that the user could initially just navigate back five times. That is something you could define yourself now. So what do I recommend as of now, early 2026? For now, really stick to navigation to do yourself a favor. Don't implement navigation three in your own production project. Play around with it, get a feeling for how it works. At some point, it will probably be the better pick, but it's really always the case in programming, especially when talking about production projects, that maturity trumps shiny new features. I have really tried all the new features of Navigation 3. I've tried to implement deep linking with it. I've tried to have nested nav graphs like behavior with it. I've made a playlist about it where I really had to deep dive into it. And it is so incredibly unfinished as a library right now, even though it's officially marked as stable. But just to give you one example, if you want to implement deep linking with Navigation 3, then that requires you to implement your own deep link matches. So your own matches for such kind of URI in order to extract your own kinds of arguments from such a string, which is such fundamental and foundational behavior. That is crazy that we have to do this on our own when receiving a deep link. On the native Android side, this is still a little bit easier because in Android, we have the android.net URI, which on the end over the kind of lets us parse a string, a URI-like string into this URI object, uh, which then also lets us access the different parts, arguments, and that kind of stuff. But for example, in Kotlin multi-platform projects, as we're in here, that's not possible because the android.net URI does not exist in the KMP shared code. So you would kind of need to come up with your own data class that implements a URI. You would need to implement your own matches or parsers that parse a string into this class. It's such a pain. There's just so much boilerplate code involved to even handle something simple like a deep link, to even get to the point where you would start having the advantages of a custom backstack. And also, I must say, even though you have more freedom with Navigation 3, but having the backstack as a data structure in your code like that I think it's actually less intuitive than the previous approach of having these nav controllers. Because even though it may be easy to understand that, okay, you have a list of screens of destinations where each destination is nothing else than a Kotlin data class that contains arguments, that part is understandable. But especially if you're new to Android, to Kotlin multi-platform development, you also need to keep in mind that the backstack has to be serializable, that it has to be restored on things like configuration changes, on things like process death on Android that you need to define this kind of a safe state configuration here in KMP with the serializers module, where you define your own extensions of it to define which specific classes it should be able to serialize. And even such little issues, if you don't do that, you won't immediately notice an issue, but the moment something like process death happens, your backstack simply won't be restored and your users will end up on the very first screen, even though you could have restored the previous history. I'm pretty sure that in a year from now, Navigation 3 is in a pretty decent state and uh, it is uh, in, a, in a state that can be used at least in, in real projects. It's a similar situation as back then when Jetpack Compose was marked as stable, when it was everything but stable. Maybe the API of it was kind of stable, but uh, it was completely unfinished. There were so many important features missing and so many things that were way too complex that could have been much easier that I can say 
just wait at least a year, then give this another check. If you just enjoy diving into such a library here and exploring it, then of course, do that now if it's just for a hobby project. But the moment we talk about production projects, about serious projects that real users use, then better stick to the mature approach. And I'm personally even in contact with one of the library's authors of Navigation 3, and even they say it's unfinished right now. That's actually also why I've stopped finishing this Navigation 3 playlist that I've started here with, I think, six videos as of now. I stopped making the deep link video, which I actually had planned. Uh, but since they are already planning to make this easier in the next month, I don't want to make a video now that is outdated in two months again. So if you now make your project depend on Navigation 3, you can already plan for a lot of refactorings in the future. And if you often have these kinds of struggles where you know, okay, should I use technology A, technology B? Should I use this approach or that approach in my real project at work, wherever? Then we actually have a mentorship program for exactly these struggles because in the end, it's our job at PL Coding to stay up to date with the most modern technologies in Android development and then just tell you which of these you really need, how you need these to really focus on the essentials on what really counts to building real scaling Android apps. So if you want to closely work together with me and my team of senior developers, then down below you will find a link to apply to this uh, Android mentorship program. Also works for KMP if you want to get better at that. So take a look, it's all described how it works, and then we will have a chat whether it actually makes sense to take a closer look at your situation before you even have to make a decision there. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you back in the next video. Have an amazing rest of your week. Bye-bye.